person was freed uh, from their sins. I don't know if you noticed uh, Gladie and Janine's face, but they had smiles on their face going down and smiles on their face coming back up. That's because they were freed from this, the enslavement of sin on that day. And that's why we celebrate our baptisms for that reason. Because Jesus frees them from their sins. And that's really our topic today as well. If you turn to John, the Gospel, the 8th chapter, John 8. We're going to start there today in several other passages, John 8. I've only ever had to uh, visit a prison. And uh, to lose your freedom, to know that feeling is horrible, and it's got to be horrendous, and I'm thankful that I've only had to visit, but the early Christians were put behind bars because of what they believed, and maybe we're not far from that today in our world, unfortunately. Notice what... Jesus says about freedom and being set free here. As he's talking, notice the audience is those Jews who had believed in him. And so these were, he's speaking directly to those who believe, but also in the audience were those who didn't believe in who he was. And so Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. You will know the truth and the truth will make you free. They answered to him, we are Abraham's descendants. We have never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it you say we will become free? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you seek to kill me, because my word has no place in you. I remember some of the most difficult words I've ever heard came from the mouth of my own father when Judy and I were testifying to him about Jesus. We were talking about sin talking about the enslavement of sin, and we're talking about how it rules our life. And he said these words, I won't be a slave to anyone. But the Bible reminds us, Paul, in the seventh chapter of Romans, that indeed we're either slave to lawlessness or righteousness. We have to make a choice. And here we're urged from Jesus to make that choice. We're either going to be a slave to sin and unrighteousness, or we're going to be released from it and live a life of righteousness. So we'll be enslaved to sin. Paul puts it this way in Galatians 5.1. It was for freedom that Jesus set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. So here Jesus warns us. It was for freedom. Freedom to walk out of jail. Freedom to live for God. To live under His grace and His mercy and His charity and His good and His blessings. Not again to be in the yoke of slavery. That means when we yoke up, someone's alongside of us. In the case of the Christian, that means we reject Jesus and yoke up with the devil. He says, if you commit sin, you're a slave to sin. And then he says later on, you're a father, you're is the devil, not Abraham. And so we yoke up again to a life of sin. You see, Christ set us free in that watery grave. The old self died with him. When they came out of Egypt, they came out of slavery. God set them free. And that's what the forgiveness of sins does for us. It sets us free from the enslavement of sin. He gives us the Holy Spirit there in baptism after He cleanses us from all of our evil sins from the past. And He relieves us from the bondage of sinful life. You God, help me understand this concept 
very early in my Christian walk. As a matter of fact, it motivated me to learn more about Jesus. A guy invited me to the prison ministry. I went down to Baltimore Penitentiary. And just just an eerie feeling still comes across my bones when I think about this. But as we passed through to go up to the chapel, those big iron gates, three sets of them, closed behind us. And what a feeling of knowing every gate that I may not come out of this place. As a matter of fact, worse than that feeling is never being able to leave. That freedom to come and go, to feel wind on your face, to go fishing, camping, hunting, playing your life any way you want. To visit your mother, you can't do it. And so your freedom is taken away. Paul says here in freedom, stand firm. While you're free, stand firm because there's a danger of being subject again to that yoke of slavery, of going back to the world, going back to the old life. It was for freedom that Jesus set us free, Paul says there in Galatians 1. Think about our freedom as Americans. Because we're Americans, we have certain rights that other countries and liberties that other countries do not have. And we see it all the time on the news. We assemble here today because we're Americans and we're free. We're able to carry our Bibles. We're able to speak about Jesus. We can pray. Not everywhere. I know we're on shaky ground these days. But we're still, as Americans, we are free. We can choose to worship whatever God we want or no God if we want. But as for Christians, we can freely worship the Lord and speak His name. We have the right to speak our mind on issues that we choose. Because we're Americans, we have the right to carry our Bibles and pray wherever we go. Thank God for the rights we still enjoy, right? I hear some amens. (laughs) We're still free. But we're also still bound. Just because we're an American and we have freedom doesn't mean we're free from the bondage of sin. And that's what Paul is trying to make that emphasis today. But also Jesus here in John chapter 8. Jesus here in John 8 is speaking to those Jews who believe they were free. They believe they were free because their father was Abraham. That's a tradition. So I I came out of the United Methodist. My mom came out of the the Catholic uh, religion. And we weren't free in that tradition. And Jesus is trying to get them to understand because we commit sin, we're slaves to it. He's the only one that can set us free. Not your denomination, not something that was passed down, not a creed from men, but the Bible and what Jesus speaks. That's the only thing that sets us free. His word. He said there that, look, the slave is not a permanent part of the house. Not a permanent part of God's household. But the son is. And he says the son will make you free indeed. Because it's his house. He said there in verse 32, if you continue in the word. There's a condition to that freedom, isn't there? You have to continue in it, abide in it, he says there. It doesn't matter if you're locked away in a prison somewhere, you're still free in Jesus. It doesn't matter if our country goes the way of communism or socialism, where all our rights are taken away, we can't speak about Jesus. If we're in him, we're still free, aren't we? So these verses are going to help us to understand that we're free indeed. I like that idea. To know what real true freedom is. And that's what he wants to make. He wants to make that point this morning. So number one, the source of our freedom. Jesus said the source of our freedom is the truth. He says the truth will make you free. If you abide my words, you're truly disciples of mine. And the truth will make you free. This is the purpose of Jesus. Here's the truth. His purpose. The truth refers to everything he's come to do in regard of him and our salvation. His purpose is seen there in verse 36 when it says, so if the Son makes you free, you'll be free indeed. Verse 58, which is not up there, it's in your Bible. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. He really made the Jews mad that day. Because see, when they say they're free in Abraham, he's saying, I was before Abraham. And so the truth is who the Lord Jesus Christ himself is. He's revealed himself. But also, as it pertains to the world, look at Romans chapter 1. You see, we're, we're free in Christ. And Jesus is reminding us of that today. But what we're up against and what we came out of is what Romans chapter 1 is going to talk about here, starting with verse 18, for us to realize that really, for all people, 
of all nations and everyone born into this world, when you come to the age of accountability, you come to the age of understanding right and wrong and you can decipher uh, uh, reality, no one is without excuse to find God. He's right before us. Notice what it says here. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. And here's why it's evident. For God made it evident to them. So the evidence is around all around us in the creation who God is. So that man indeed can find him. Because notice what it says. For since the creation of the world. See the world was created according to the Bible. And not only that, look around for yourself. Don't believe the statistics. I looked up last night, I put in there, you know, um, how old's the earth? You know, in that uh, Google thing, Uncle Google, somebody calls them. We looked it up, and right now, they've calculated, with the use of the Hubble telescope, somehow, some way, we got some facts now, the earth is 13.82 billion years old. But listen to what the Bible says. Since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes... Go with your Google and say, where do we get matter? Where did the explosion come from? How did you get the material for the Big Bang? You ought to hear some of the stuff they say. It's just remarkable. One of them is, well, they have particles and antiparticles. And uh, they fought each other off, and that somehow one was left over, and that gave us a Big Bang. You can't even get a kid in third grade to believe that. But it says, by his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature has been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculation, and the, and the foolishness of her heart was darkened. Isn't that what's happening to our society? Darken? Because they simply will not trust what God has done around them. Pinch yourself in the fabric you have on. Where do you think that came from? Look at the color of the eyes of the person next to you. Intrinsic design in everything. God made it known to every person that there's a creator. That everything was designed and it was invisible. The Bible tells us it was invisible. Of course it was. It wasn't existence until he brought it into existence. It didn't happen by chance or purpose or some crazy idea of man. That's just a suppression of truth of what really has happened. But yet it's so casually taught everywhere in our face all the time. From kindergarten to college, that's what they teach our children. When you teach evolution, you're teaching there is no God. You teach evolution, you say there was no design or no creation or anything like that. You lose the value of human beings when you teach evolution. That's what they've done to our kids. You know, I hate that little symbol, Darwin in the fish. I feel like going up to this person and saying to them, how many explosions did it take to give you that Ford you're driving? Now, here's the thing. Ford ran off the first assembly line. What was it, uh, 1904, I think it was, the first Model T came off the assembly line. And... uh, so it only took 112 years to design, the, to design the Ford 150. But see, if it was evolution, it would have took much longer, wouldn't it? And so we see God through the creation, which leads us to the truth who Jesus is. But notice the scriptures tell us who Jesus is. Notice in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4. 1 Corinthians 3 through 4. You know the Bible's still the bestseller? Eight billion copies sold. You just got to pray that people would read it. Notice what it says here. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received that Jesus died for our sins according to the what? And that he was buried and that he was raised and on the third day according to the scriptures. In Romans 4.25, listen to what it says. Here's what Jesus says. Jesus, who was delivered for our offenses, was raised again for justification. That means he freed us from the death penalty of our sins. The truth about Jesus and the source of our freedom is found in all of Scripture. As a matter of fact, 
The history of the Bible is his redemptive story. He said this of himself in John 5.39. Listen to this. Jesus said of himself, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. So the source of our freedom is found in Jesus alone. Don't miss this. In verse 31 and 32, he said to those Jews who were believing, if you continue, if you continue, if you abide, then you will truly be my disciples. The truth will make you free indeed. Number two, the source of our freedom. Jesus said in verse 36, that when a person uh, becomes free, they are free indeed. The first word translated free here comes from the word that means to set at liberty. So now you're free, you walk away. The picture is liberating a slave from bondage. So Jesus liberates us. Um, way back in, I was working at 40 West Volkswagen up in Catonsville, uh, probably in the, it was the early 80s, and um, a ticket came across into the department where I worked, and the last name was McKinney. I wanted to find out who McKinney was. So I'm um, looking around, I said, you know, point out Mr. McKinney for me. I want to meet him, right? And so they pointed him out to me. He was an African-American uh, a man. And we had so much fun with that. We both had the same last names. And uh, come to find out that his family name came from McKinney's from Asheville, North Carolina, where they had tobacco farms. And so he was not only liberated, he said his family never was enslaved. Because the people that they worked for and worked with were like family, so much like family, they gave that name to them and they embraced it. So that's the liberty we're talking about here. The second translation for free refers to one who is freeborn or born free. I know you think about born free, as free as the wind. But that's as if you're over 50, I guess. I know some of you remember that. Some of you forgot as much as you remembered. But it says the freedom that Jesus offers when he saves us is so complete. It is as if we were never slaves to begin with. But it is as if we were free sons of God. You see, the liberty we have in Jesus blotted out everything in the past, takes care of the present, and also the future. I like that bargain, don't you? You know, when you play Monopoly, you know, you're in jail, you know, and you want to get out as soon as you can because you want to beat somebody else to the kitty to get all the money. So we don't want to be in jail. We want to be liberated to play the game. So the moment that we're baptized, sins are forgiven, washed away, passes the past. God no longer holds it against us. But it says here, the idea is for the future, we're safe. Not to return to the enslavement of prison. That's what he offers but because we have free will, he warns us, don't go back to the yoke of slavery. You see, it's far cry from the old life uh, before we obey Jesus. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. Look in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verse 1 and 2. Actually, it's going to be 1 through 3 on your screen, but I'm going to read through verse 5, and you'll see why I'm going to do that. He says, if we commit sin... We're a slave of it. And see, today we take sin lightly in our world, don't we? There's so much sin going on, it almost has become normal. We rub elbows with it every day. But notice what it says here, and you were dead in your trespasses and sin. That's what sins mean. You were dead to God, not a part of his relationship. You were dead in your trespasses and sin in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, right? That was all of us. According to the prince and power of the air. What? I was under the devil's power? Yep. As embarrassing as that is, that's the truth, isn't it? That we were under the force of somebody. We weren't free at all, were we? But we think we are, just like the Jews. For the spirit that now is working in the sons of disobedience, among them we too were all were formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we're by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. You know, as I, every time that I got high, I knew there's a possibility of getting caught. That went along with the guilt of what am I doing to my life? 
It's wrong and it's illegal in society. And it kills your life. It takes your future. But it says here we were children of wrath. One step away from judgment. One step away from death. One step, one step away from eternal separation from the Lord. But it says here, but God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. Not of yourself. It is a gift of God. So here in these following passages are areas where we've been liberated from. Listen to this. The first one is from Romans 5, 9. We've been delivered from the wrath of God. Much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved, notice what it says, from the wrath of God through Jesus. And I don't know why this flashed in my face, but it did. But I wonder what the person or the people thought in the days of Noah after that ark was built and those first raindrops fell upon their face. It was, oh no, what that man of righteousness was preaching all along is now happening to us. The wrath of God is coming. And they had to learn to swim and make boats real fast. Then it says here in Romans 8.1 that we've been delivered, we've been freed from condemnation. Now you don't want to live under condemnation. That means no matter how hard you try, you'll never succeed to live under condemnation. It says here, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's freedom, isn't it? Then it says in John 5.24, Jesus' words, we've been freed from death. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him, a lot of people here, but believes in him who sent me, believes in God, has eternal life, does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. If you go back to the story of the rich man and Lazarus, the moment they died, something happened. For Lazarus, the angels bore him up. For the rich man, he found himself in torment. The first thing he thought, drop of water. Second thing he thought, go tell somebody about my kids and my brothers because I don't want them to come here in this heat, in this judgment. You see, the second that you die, you'll know whether you're in Christ or out of Christ. That's why he warns us to stay free. Romans 6, 14 puts it this way. See, we've been freed from the power, the allurement, the danger of sin. When it says this, this happens in baptism. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. You see, we've been freed from the law, like coming out of prison when we were baptized into Christ. Free now to live under grace and not law day in and day out. A lot of us with our personalities sometimes, our temperament, we're perfectionists. And perfectionists have no fun in this world. You know why? It is far from perfect and so are you. See, all their friends aren't perfect, their children aren't perfect, their husband isn't perfect, their wife isn't perfect. You try to make them perfect, that's insanity. It doesn't work. And then finally it says here in James 4, 7, we've been freed from the power of Satan. We give him way too much credit, especially as Christians. It says here, submit therefore to God, resist the devil who will flee from you. You see, resisting him is saying no. We can do that. But that has no power unless we submit to God. Because submitting to him gives you the knowledge and the tools and the strength that you don't have to defeat him. So you've got to have both. You've got to submit and flee. You've got to resist. You know what resistance is, right? Right now, you've got to resist going to lunch and eating a good meal. You've got to resist thinking about the Ravens losing again. You've got to resist. <laughs> so the source of our freedom is Jesus alone. The scope of our freedom is absolute, complete freedom from sin. God offers eternal life. But we've got to hang on to it, don't we? And finally, it says here, the sacrifice of our freedom. The freedom we enjoy, enjoy right now as Americans was not cheap, was it? Over a million brave soldiers died in that revolutionary war 
Their blood was spilled. They paid for our freedom today with their blood. It was real. They were there. If you ever look at the weapons of the day, and uh, I, for some of you hunters, you know what I'm talking about, but a pumpkin ball is a round piece of lead. Just a ball, isn't it, John? And uh, it's like a marble, but it's lead and it's bigger. And that's what hits your body when they shoot you. And the wounded in the blood was horrendous. It was as bad as being sliced up when they had nothing but swords. But they died for that. Consider those who signed the Declaration of Independence. Listen to this. Five signers were captured by the British for treason. They were tortured before they died. Twelve had their homes ransacked and burned. Two sons of the Revolutionary War died. Two other sons were captured. Nine of the 56 fought and died of wounds or hardships because of the war. So what kind of people, what kind of men were they? 24 were lawyers and jurists. 11 were merchants. 6 were farmers and large plantation owners. Men of means, well educated. But when they signed the Declaration of Independence, they knew full well the penalty would be death if they were captured. And so one individual, Carter Braxton, Virginia, he was a wealthy planter and trader, uh, saw his own ship sunk in the harbor by the British Navy. He sold his home, his properties, he paid his debt, and he died in poverty. At the York war, at the Battle of Yorktown, a British general named Cornwallis had taken over Thomas Nelson's home for his headquarters. Nelson quietly ordered General Washington to open fire on Nelson's house. The house was destroyed, and Nelson died in bankruptcy. These are stories and sacrifices of the Revolutionary War that set this country free from Britain. They had security, but the value of liberty was more important to them. So our freedom as America, it was purchased by, uh, by a very high cost, wasn't it? And so it gave us national freedom. But it pales in comparison to what Jesus did for all people for all time. Listen to this. 1 Timothy 2.6, it puts it this way. At the cross, it was there that Jesus gave himself as a ransom for all, it says. A testimony given at the proper time. You see, every generation, countless, countless souls have been ransomed by Jesus. He paid it with his own blood. High cost for our freedom. 1 John 2.2 2 reads this way. It was at the cross that he himself became a propitiation for our sins. That means that it turned away the wrath of God that was due us. Who took the wrath? Jesus. And we're going to see it here in Isaiah. Isaiah 53 puts it this way. It was there at the cross that he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed, it says, for our iniquity. The chastening of our well-being, it fell on him. And by his scourging, we are healed. You see, our liberty cost Jesus the heaviness of guilt. Guilt's heavy, isn't it? So you can ignore it, and it keeps getting heavier and ruins your life. Or you can do something about it and repent and get that heavy weight off. But Jesus took the weight of our guilt on himself. It says he was crushed. He took the crushing blow of our grief. Now here's what's amazing. Jesus felt, as he walked through this life, our grief, whatever it is, loss of a person, grieving over your own sin, grieving over loss, it says that he was crushed, that blow of grief. Now, Jesus personally, did he have any reason to grieve over himself? No, not at all. He didn't have to come here at all and suffer any grief or loss at all, did he? That grief was ours. He took it upon himself. And how about the deep lacerations across his back for our sins? The punishing bruises for iniquity. Uh, you ever been punched? Raise your hand. Yeah, at least in his shoulder, right? You know, when you're like this. But a heavy bruise from a punch is no fun, is it? Especially the bruises that go right to your bone. And they hit our Lord. And he took that bruising for our freedom. 
Freedom cost, cost, cost Jesus the, the piercing and the wounds that he had. Uh, have you ever been stabbed? you ever stabbed yourself? <laughs> Hopefully nobody stabbed you. you. ever stabbed yourself by accident? We did a darn thing when we were kids. We played that chicken game with your knives. So your parents don't want you to have a knife. Don't get a knife. Every time in the 4th of July parade, they came down with those knives with compasses on them. Remember those guys? And you always wanted a knife. Your parents say, no, get the kazoo. Don't, that won't hurt you. Not the knife. But finally you get a knife and you, and you, you go like this to each other. And you get stabbed. You get pierced through. That's by accident. Jesus knew the piercing was coming. He knew it was coming. Through his hands. Through his feet. He was willing to do that for us. It cost him deep anguish in his soul. Now here again, Jesus had no reason to have any anguish. Did he? And uh, why didn't he come a year before his death? He could have done that, right? But no, he, he chose the anguish of living with us for 33 years. Now see, a lot of your anguish is your laugh because of people, isn't it? It's because of people. What people do. They promise you love and leave you. And they hurt you. But Jesus didn't have to have any anguish, but it says that he took it on. He had deep anguish in his soul, it says there. That's deep anguish. It goes all the way to your soul. Past your brain, past your heart, into your soul. That's what he was willing to take on. He had a broken heart. Uh, you know, the physicians told us that. He had water around his heart. It was broken. I can understand that, can't you? You, you have children. They'll break your heart, won't they? Your heart, you lay everything on the line. And they break your heart. He knows what that is. And then his last breath. Now, what would you say at your last breath? He says it's finished. Because he wasn't thinking about himself. He was thinking about you. Through all, down through the generations. It's finished for you. That was his last breath. He did it for us. He paid it in full. Our freedom is paid in full. Innocent blood spilt for guilty. He bled to death for freedom to set us free from this. And finally, it's a reminder here in Galatians 1 when Paul said this, it was for freedom that Jesus set us free. Therefore, keep standing and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. You know what that means? That means we can go backwards. Can't we? We can go back. Uh, the Bible warns us of that all over the place. That we can go backwards. And we can be yoked up again and be slaves to the old life. The Bible also tells us this. It's worse than your former state of just being lost. You know why? Because you had it. You were out of prison. You came through and walked out as easy as I walked out this morning. You're free to breathe again, to hear the birds sing, to visit your mother, to visit your mother. You've got to get mother in here. Because that's who you're going to miss. Then we're going to miss God. He doesn't want us to go back. And so look, he wants us to live free, but in that freedom, he wants us to help set other people free. Now, this is our communion time. It's the perfect time to remember the cost of our freedom. The sacrifice of the Son of God was willing to do that for us. John said this. Here comes his nephew. Here he comes, no, his, his cousin. Here he comes. And here's what John says. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away your sins, the sins of the world. And as we commune, there's a cup, blood. There's a body, wafer, his body, sacrificed. Say so to spill his blood for the guilty. He had to allow his body to come here to the earth, and he had a wonderful, beautiful, eternal, spiritual body, but yet he came in his flesh. And so when we remember, we remember the flesh. We remember his blood spilled innocent blood so we have forgiveness of sins so as we partake let's think about Jesus think that he did set us free of his cause his own life Father would you bless these emblems the bread because it's his body 
It was his body that he gave. He said, this is love to lay down your life for your friends. So Father, it is a privilege to be a friend of Jesus who gave his body broken for us. Would you bless this emblem and thank you for Jesus. And the cup, bless the cup because within it, what it means is blood was spilled. Innocent blood, Jesus's. Of all the wars fought for our freedom, the greatest death we have is Jesus. The greatest sacrifice we have is Him because He paid it all for our freedom. Get out of jail free. Thank you, Jesus. We pray your blessing upon the cup and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name I pray.